Hi, it is the uh, 1st of October, it's Saturday night. I am Dr. Pam, this is my NCE group, and this is Helping Relationships. Um, this is a huge part of the test and a huge part of what we do all day, every day. It's really important to put the verbiage to what you do. You can put the verbiage into your test, but you definitely cannot put your test into the, into your work into the test. Unless the question says, according to Shana, <laughs> Unless it says that, that is not the right answer. Okay, <laughs> so who asked me a question? I have a question. It's not related to this topic. It's just yes. related to when do we take the test where uh, you can tell us that we are ready or not? Are you taking taking? With, with one of us individually? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Then your therapist will tell your therapist. Your <laughs> Your yes. will tell oh, you. <laughs> okay, she will tell me. So we really okay. recommend 90 days. We're, we're going to recommend 90 days. We're going to recommend that you study for 90 days. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, none of us can make any adult do anything, right? So I, I can say to my client, this is what I need you to do. And then they come back and they're like, well, I didn't study, Pam. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, I'm going to keep teaching. I'm going to keep teaching, but I, I, I can't drill it into your head. So some of my clients, we go through stuff, they do exactly what we suggest and we get through it uh, in plenty enough time and, and we're good. Um, some of our clients, um, life gets in the way, right? Those kids want to eat and the boss like wants paperwork turned in, like dang, doesn't he know you're studying for a test? So it really is up to you individually between you and your tutor. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I have a question, Dr. Pam. Yes. Um, when I went in, I actually went in and picked a date before I even signed up for individual. Okay. And, um, I didn't see um, January or February, so I chose December. Okay. Um, December what? December 5th. And who are you? Have you started tutoring already? Yes. Okay. Um, um, so as, as we get closer, the, they will tell you if they think you're not ready. But we really only recommend 90 days. So this is October. So all of October, all of November. So that's, if you are putting the energy in, that's very doable. Okay. Because I was okay. wondering if, is it a way I can ex go in? I didn't see it. You, so. you can. Because January is not, well, not open yet, is my it's understanding. Not, January is not open. Not open. Yeah. No, so I had the same been. issue too. When I signed yeah. up, it I was still. December 5th and December 17th. January yeah. wasn't an option for me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I didn't even, that's I didn't that's even exactly see the for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. I did so, not sign up because I don't want to sign up and then pay again. Um, um, so but, I think it's it's fifty dollars to change your date. Is that correct? I'm pretty sure what it is. It's fifty. I was told it was fifty dollars to change your date. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that. So, but but I. Oh, that's better than paying the full amount when you're not ready. I personally don't have enough self-esteem to keep taking this test. I, I forget the money. I don't have enough self-esteem. I cannot, I'll be transparent with you. I don't. So, and I know that uh, Bandura talks about self-efficacy, right? I'm going to fight for myself and all this good stuff, but I, I'll be in the corner crying. I can't, I can't do that. Um, so, uh, but I don't, when it comes to those dates, we really don't recommend early January either. First of all, I don't work the two weeks of Christmas. I, I travel um, and we are, most of us, most of us are closed between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Most of my students, my clients don't study. They're on vacation. So mm -hmm. if you're going to look at a January date, it needs to be closer to the end of January because pretty much the world shuts down between Christmas and like January 4th. Mm -hmm. So definitely not early January, because I, I think that unless you're really going to be the one that has me, like me, no life, and you study the whole time, but if you have a life, <laughs> I take that back. I'm going on a cruise this year, so I'll be gone for uh, 10 days. First cruise since COVID. <gasps> ah. Other questions? Dr. I have a question. Oh, wait. Can you see me? Cynthia? Yes. Yes, I can. Hi, Dr. Pam. Um, I'm asking a question about um, helping relationships and groups. So I know that there are a lot of the same theories, like uh -huh. there's Adlerian theories, uh -huh. essential gestalt. Um, and my, I'm using a Helwig book and I am uh -huh. tutoring with one of your coaches. And uh -huh. my question is, I know that um, in different sections of the book, um, there are different techniques um, 
for the same theorist. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So I so I wanted to know it's kind of confusing. So my what I wanted to do was kind of because Adlerian therapy is Adlerian therapy no matter what, right? No exactly. matter individual you, group family. It's still going to be a couple. It's still going to be Adler. He talks about uh, inferiority and superiority. He talks about birth order. Yeah. Um, he uses the term like spitting in your soup, um, yes. lifestyles. So all those words belong to Adler. Yes. So, yeah. So um, just because it's not in that particular place of the chapter doesn't mean that it doesn't apply. Is that correct? So, uh, yes. So if you're, if you're using the Hellwig book, so well, what we really focus on mainly is then the theorist, because once you know the theorist, it won't matter what it's in. It right. won't matter if it's in a group or a, a setting. It just won't matter, right? So, right. you know, if, if we're looking at psychodynamic and they're talking about my id, ego, and super ego, it, it doesn't matter if it's a couple or if it's a group. It just matters that you know that that's a psychoanalytic approach. Right, okay. right. I, my my confusion was that it, like, for example, in groups, this, the techniques in groups are not the same as the techniques in individual. Or they some would of be, though. They, they would be. And Adlerian right. is going to be an Adlerian, right? Right. But what, what I'm saying, it's not listed in like, I'm a, like a literal thinker. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's literally not, not listed in like, for example, I don't think birth order is in group and is in the section. So, group. I would agree. I would totally agree. And the, the assumption is that once you know Adler, you know Adler. Okay. okay. So yeah, I just okay. wanted to make sure that I was, that it, it was, because I remember yes. you saying in, in another um, group section, group session, that Adler, you know, Adlerian therapy is in, the same as group, individual, mm -hmm. or, um, mm -hmm. or couple. So I just wanted to make sure I was on the right track. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Cynthia Adler is a neo Freudian. What does that mean? That they be they believe in the unconscious, but they don't believe in a, um it and a super ego. Yeah. I know. It's good. Very good. Very good. Thank so you. All of my neo Freudians don't believe in that sex thing either, right? Yeah. But if there's a sex question, it's always going to be Freud. Right. Yes. So psychoanalytic is what Freud started with, right? So that yeah. was three to five years lay on my couch. I, I worked before, like, you know, HMOs came in. So you could really lay on my couch for three to five years. I made mega bucks. No one asked any questions. It was right. so weird. <laughs> insurance came in right and now it's called psychodynamic and same kind of theory but you only get like 12 sessions before i was getting like you know mega sections um but yeah so psychoanalytic is original theory and psychodynamic is what we use now absolutely very very good job and no sex i only wanted to believe that was sex it was only <laughs> that was freud uh somebody else have a question So let me just ask questions in general. Let's see how will we know our theorists. Because Cynthia, you mentioned before knowing the theorists, no matter how they work. So in the career theory, uh, Savikas, Savikas is one of my career theory. He's called a constructivist. Savikas uses narrative therapy. Mm -hmm. Anybody brave enough to tell me what that means? What narrative therapy is? Mm -hmm. Oh, so narrative therapy is when the the um the counselor kind of gets gets the the client to uh, write down their thoughts or 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 their past. So they're kind of deconstructing their thoughts and kind of reconstructing together with the client the a new a new story. Kind of, kind of looking at your tutor. Co Joyce, Coach Joyce. Joyce, I'm proud. Yes. <laughs> She's amazing. I, just, I love awesome. her. Rob's this week. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love and that's what her. I was looking for was the vocabulary. Because remember, every theorist has their own vocabulary. Yes. And that's what narrative and, and then Sabika's what under career. That's what he would use. So he talked about, and the words I'm looking for is, is understand the story in your head, right? You've got this story in your head, something somebody's told you or something that you've heard and you keep repeating that story over and over and over again. So what he said, whether it's career or in, in individual therapy, right? You're going to uh, take it out of your head, externalize it, right? Take it out, deconstruct it, take it apart. Like, why do I believe this crap anyway? <laughs> rewrite it, reauthor it, and put it back in your head. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And what you're looking for in career then is Savika said the same thing. He talked about that, the, the, um, the, um, a story we tell ourselves in career, like like whether or not we have to get a that follow one of those tests, like the SDS or any of those things, to get your career and get this stuff done. He said that's that's a social construct. It's something that society's made up. Where did you learn that story? So the same process. Take it out, take it apart, rewrite, put it back in your head. Very good, very good, very good. Who is um um. What's that guy's name that looks at the empathy in the therapist? Everybody remember him? Roger. Paul Roger. Paul Roger. No, no, no. Paul the Roger. empathy Paul in Roger. the counselor. Paul, Paul. Paul Rogers said that he had said it, but the guy who measured the empathy in the counselors, what was his name? Karkov. Who said that? Five point empathy. Geneva. Geneva, Geneva, I, I I can't see you. I can't hear you if I can't see you. I'm driving. Okay, Lord. Okay, super close. Are you are you safe? I'm guessing. I am. Okay, no storms, no no floods. No, we just had heavy um wind and rain, but other than that, we're good. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. So Carhuff, Carhuff said that he talked about the importance of the therapist being empathy, and he had a scale. So, so what does that mean? It measured, the how, it measured how the therapist was able to um, read and interpret what the client was saying. So don't think that much into it. So it really okay. measured the, the ability to empathize with the client. Okay. So if I, if I, you know, came into the session today and I said, oh my gosh, you know what? I uh, just in Geneva, Geneva. So I, I asked her about her, the weather, because I know that she lives in that area. And we were talking this week about getting prepared for the storm. So then if I said, Geneva, you're in your car. So, Hey, be careful. And I didn't mention anything about it. Like that's not empathetic, right? Empathetic is addressing the client's feelings. So Karhoff said it's either going to be a one or, oh, well, he didn't say that. For the test, it's going to be a one or a five. It's going to be so clear that the client is not the least, that the therapist is not the least bit empathetic at all. Oh my gosh, my husband, he just came in and he, he packed his stuff up and he left and he's leaving me. And I was like, well, Pam, do you want to book your next session? Like, like you just ignored all my feelings. So five is really acknowledging my feelings and what I said. So remember, empathy is what we do. Our friends are sympathetic, but we are empathetic. We understand where the client is. We can verbalize that to the client. So Carhuff is one of those ones that will scale from one to five. It's going to be very, very obvious. It's never going to be a two, three, or a four. It might say four and five, but it's never going to be like that middle thing because that's really just someone's opinion. So you're looking for it to always be like that area of a five, a one or a five. Okay. Make sense? So there, there are those theories of consultation. Do, do we know those? I know. So in general, we don't do a lot of consultation. First of all, consultation is very, very expensive. <coughs> I will, I, I do consulting and I will come to your agency and I'll tell you exactly what is wrong. And I'll be there for about 24 hours. and I'll charge you a little over $5,000 and you can do whatever you want to with my information. You can throw it out the window if you want. So it's very rare that you're going to seek consultation as an agency. So when you're seeing that, that's not, that's as an agency, you're most often not going to do that. If you're in private practice, seek consultation is a different thing. So if you're working for an agency, you seek supervision, but if you're in private practice, you'll seek consultation. And that's going to be someone who just kind of guides you through those information. But when it talks about our consulting and what that looks like, let me share my screen with you. Okay. So these are the theories of consultation. Okay. Um, and just kind of knowing what they are. So, and you might not always see their name. You might just see like the behavioral one. So Bergen, he did our behavioral model. So remember with any behavioral person, he doesn't really care how you feel, how you think. He only cares about what he sees. So he'll come into the agency 
uh, and he will then problem identify, problem and analyze, plan, plan, impl plan, implement, and problem evaluate. He's most often going to use an FBA. What is that one? A functional behavioral analysis. Uh, and Lynn's like, I knew that. I knew that. I was just afraid to say it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if you've worked in the school system before, we always we see an FBA often. An FBA is looking at the antecedents, what happened before and what happened after, the antecedents and the consequences. So if he's looking at your agency and looking at some problems in your agency, he's going to look at, so either the antecedent is causing the problem, what's happening before, or the consequences aren't strong enough. So if we know if we change the A or the C, that changes the behavior. So Bergman is the behavioral model. Bandura, we should all know him. In careers, Bandura talks about self-efficacy and our right to believe in ourselves and fight for ourselves. Krumboltz's theory is also self-efficacy. Krumboltz in career talked about, right, we, we are all have different, um, our, our, or what, oh gosh. We have differing um, uh, self, we all have differing self-efficacy, right? Some of us are going to fight and some of us are not going to fight. So Bandura is social learning. Way back when, before all of you were born, except for a couple of you, Bandura was known for the Bobo doll. Okay, and if you ever have nothing else to do, you can go up and pull the video and kind of see what happened. Uh, but this was really like ground, uh, groundbreaking research at the time. This happened in the early 60s. Um, and the Bobo doll was one of those dolls that would not, it, no matter what you did, it wouldn't fall over. It sand in the bottom. Okay. If you watch some of my early videos, I used to say that I had one, but I never really had one. I just pretended I have two brothers and my mom would not buy, you know, Godfrey son. I could not have a doll like that because I was a girl, but my brothers had one and I'd punch it when they weren't looking. So the Bobo doll, no matter how hard you hit it, it would not fall down. So the experiment was that the kids had played with the Bobo doll in the classroom. And then the teacher went in. They observed the teacher being extremely uh, aggressive with the Bobo doll. She, she was like beating it up, stomping, kicking on it. And then once they saw the children do that, the teacher do that, the children then went back and they were even worse. One of them talks about there was a, a toy gun on the, the cabinet and the one of the kids put up the toy gun to present to shoot the Bobo doll. And they had never seen that kind of behavior before. So what a big deal was, that was what really changed television programming back in the 70s and 80s. They really started putting their shows on after nine o'clock. Um, and that was before um, we had 17 channels. Remember, we had like three channels. This is before Fox when we had three channels, ABC, NBC. I know, I know you don't remember, but there was a time that cartoons only played on Saturdays. I know, I know, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> but it really was, it was groundbreaking of, of learning how we learn. And what the, the, the point of it is that children learn, especially when there's someone in authority, they definitely are really going to um, take that into consideration on how they behave. So whenever you see social learning, that's the basis of this. This is where Bobo Bandura came from, you're the Bobo doll. So that's how you learn how to sit on elevators, right? You, know, you didn't go to elevator or standing school. That's how you learn to wait in line because we've learned from society, okay? So that is a Bandura. So whenever you see him, whenever you see that term, it's about social learning theory, okay? So Bandura, social learning model. And again, you may not see his name. You just may see social learning theory. And that means that we learn with society. We learn by watching others in society. Okay. Shine is known as my doctor patient model. Okay. So um, that means he's going to come in, tell you what's wrong with your agency, and he's going to fix it. Okay, so that's all that means is doctor patient. These are models of consultation. When you've hired someone to come into your agency to tell you what's going on and how to fix it. Okay. Um, when it comes to cultural also, so this is um, we're not individual, group, all those things. People of, of are, are, are people that are in, considered in that diversity category, black, brown, Asian, things like that. 
prefer the doctor model, the doctor patient model. They want to come in and you tell them what to do. So when it comes to those cultural questions, they would much rather prefer a Freudian technique because Freud's the expert, right? Freud tells you, you're wrong. I'm the expert. Do this, do this, do this. They don't like the, and again, I know I'm thinking generalities and I'm please don't, I'm not trying to stereotype. My goal is just to help you pass this test, okay? But they, they would not prefer, they don't like the, the Carl Rogers where I'm the expert, right? I want you to come in. I want to come in. I want you to tell me exactly what to do. That's that doctor-patient model. So this is what it looks like in consultation, but also then when it comes to individual and group therapy, that is more, again, the um, psychoanalytic approach. Okay. You'll see Kaplan a lot. Um, so in, uh, Kaplan has these nine stages of consultation, but more often you're going to see Kaplan in group. You're going to see him talk about those primary, secondary, and tertiary interventions. Anybody? Say that again, Dr. Payne. Primary, secondary, and tertiary interventions. Is that Lisa? Yes, ma'am. I know you know these. Yeah. <laughs> so you want me to explain? I do. Oh, okay. So primary is re uh, reaching the masses. It's still it's a pre preventive um, method. Um, it's re reaching the masses, and then um, that's and then secondary is uh, still preventive, but it's reaching the um, high-risk people, is dealing with the high-risk people um, that have dealt with, um, okay, so, me, so COVID, examples? okay, so yeah, COVID, right. there you go. Um, everybody was in, everybody was um, aware of, they made everybody aware of COVID by telling them to wear the um, mask, social distance, and um, wash your hands, sanitize. And then people call COVID, and so the second uh, secondary, they allow the high risk people to get the vaccination first, which is like your nurses, doctor, first responders, and then um, tertiary, they're still trying to prevent it from spreading even more. So they they still tell you to social distance and wear your mask, and so they're trying to prevent it from spreading, even though people already had it. Absolutely, absolutely. So primary, secondary, and tertiary. So that's often, that's a, that's a Kaplan also. I know he talks about his, his consultation theory, but most often on the test, you're going to see his primary, secondary, and tertiary um, um, uh, interventions. Interventions, absolutely, absolutely. Dr. Tom, I have a question. Yes. Um, so for primary, wouldn't it be more psychoeducational uh, groups or am I just referring to it? Well, psycho- It can be. It can be. So in elementary school and elementary school, I don't know now, but back a million years ago when I went to school, everybody got the D.A.R.E. program. Every kid in elementary school got the D.A.R.E. program. OK, so Every like, this is more so. so like for us. So I'm a case manager here in Oklahoma. I, I, how I broke it down for primary is more educational because of school based intervention, school based intervention is more educational for, uh, for the kids. So do you tell and, everybody, though? Uh, they have. A specific it's like a mentoring class kind of sort it's just like an elective for them. so if it's a mentoring class or people are handpicked that's secondary no 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 i'm okay. talking about all the kids all the kids okay so all, all, if all the kids get it yes okay. if all the kids get it yes 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 um so most of you are probably not remember, but are secondary like you said so like so the the secondary is more like like what you said is that are hand selected and then tertiary how i remember it is more uh more human restoration in the hospital clinical settings uh they stay there and they don't leave is that correct uh, it could right be track. someone who comes out of rehab they've already had the illness and they're coming back so tertiary is still going to be keeping that from from relax from relapsing or keeping it uh, from spreading okay Okay, so it actually started, I know you're, again, not old enough to remember, but there's this thing like called HIV a million, like a million years ago. I know, I know, I know. And honestly, when HIV first started, we did not know. We had no idea how it was spread. None at all. We did not, yeah. before it realized it was a blood-borne pathogen, we didn't know if it was airborne. We didn't know if you could drink out of glasses. We did not know. So in the beginning, what we did is we really just kind of, you know, put all these things out on the news, the same way you saw with COVID, it was everywhere, right? Be careful, HIV, we're not sure you're going to get it. I mean, it was everywhere. 
So we handed out condoms. We, I mean, it was, it was anyone old enough to remember when we first, it first came out, right? So it was really like, we just didn't know. We just didn't know. So everybody got the same information. So then when we realized at the time we did like HIV and then um, AIDS. So what we did then is when people were diagnosed with HIV, that was considered secondary. Okay, so the goal of secondary was, yes, you're HIV positive, but you haven't had any of the, um, um, what are they called, the uh, parasitic diseases that kill you. So we're trying to keep your T cells, T cell counts up, right? We're trying to give you the medications. We're trying to do everything we can because you're at more higher risk of getting AIDS. And then AIDS was then tertiary. So we're trying to keep you from spreading it. We're trying to keep you uh, alive. So that's actually where it started from, but it can be used with anything, teen pregnancy, right? So, you know, we hand out condoms, um, we, uh, whatever the community issue happens to be at the time, the public health issue, that's what, and I, 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 I am sorry, I really have not kept up on monkeypox, I should. Um, are we doing some, are we seeing some commercials? Are we seeing some things out there in general? Are we doing monkeypox like a primary that everybody gets some information? So they uh, talk about on the news uh, a little bit here, but they're not really, it's not really an outbreak like that here. Okay. I, I just haven't, I haven't seen it, anything about it, but are we still believing? Go ahead, Brandy. Nothing in Michigan. Brandy, will you say something? Oh, I was going to say, I've seen it, I mean, not with monkeypox, but I've seen it used a lot with, um, in education with our tier one, tier two, and tier three. Mm-hmm. Um, so whether it be in, I'm a school counselor, so whether it be with our mental health services, with counseling services and with academics, so like all kids are on tier one mm -hmm. and then when we move to tier one, that would, tier two, that would be our small groups. So whether we're pulling kids who we see who are having some uh, social emotional uh, maybe uh, issues or things like that. So we pull them for small groups. In the academic realm, it could be that kids are having difficulties with academics, so they're getting pulled for small groups for academic reasons. And then you have your tertiary that they're being maybe even in those individual, um, and you're seeing them one-on-one -on -one for check-ins, for social-emotional, and then they're even in smaller groups for the 45-45, those kids who have felt star, and you're needing right. to see them for that. So that's kind of how I'm associated. Am I seeing that correctly? You're absolutely what right. You're absolutely right. Absolutely. That's exactly what it looks like. And that's the goal is, is really to kind of keep it, keep, we want to educate everybody. And most often it's education. Like you said before, most often it's education, but it really could be something as simple as like handing out condoms at the, the public health department. That still gets everybody. Everybody can go yeah. and pick up condoms. No questions asked. That's, that's still going to be a primary prevention. And that, and that's the, yeah. So tier one is everyone gets it. It's everyone mm -hmm. has access to it. Everyone like I'm available to everyone, but then when we come to the small groups and then the mm -hmm. individual, it's like, that's targeted to certain people or cer certain populations because they need it more mm -hmm. and it's based Absolutely. on data. It's data driven. Very good. Very good. Very good. Okay, I'm gonna pull up some test questions, guys. I'm not gonna go over all the theories just because of time. I'm gonna to try to see what it looks like in a test question. Ask me a particular, ask me a, a theorist that you want to know more information about or what words that theorist uses. No. Um, let's see here. So Gestalt, what are his words? I'm finished. Here now. Here now. Empty chair. Holistic. Home. Complete. What is what is the goal of Gestalt? To become whole. Yeah. To get exactly. rid of. To get rid of unfinished business. business. Okay. So the goal is to be whole. Because the word Gestalt means whole, and I can only be whole after I've gotten rid of that unfinished business, right? So he's called an experientialist. That means he's hands on. Right. He actually, you know, uh, you, you, you talk to that chair right there and your mom don't have to be dead. It can be your your, your, your ex-mother-in-law is still alive and you just need to get rid of some of the baggage there. Just saying. Not nothing. No countertransference. Just saying. OK, so <laughs> I know I'm the only one in the group with issues. I'm not going to pretend. I know it's just me, but I got a really good therapist. <laughs> So I really just want to make it real. These are not foreign terms. These are terms that you do every single day. 
Uh, Margaret Mailer. Sandra asked about Margaret Mailer. Uh, Taylor, tell me about Margaret Mailer. Uh, Margaret Mailer. Isn't she? No, no, wait, no, that's group. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, I, Lisa? I, can I try? Yes, please. Okay, Margaret Mailer, object. I'm sorry, do I see you? Yes, you do. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, so I see, I, I hear with my eyes. I know it's strange, but. <laughs> okay, it's um, object something. She, her theory is. You know, the girl's going to fail if you teach her that. Object something. <laughs> Come on. It's object. I want to say relations, but that's not it. It's it is. Object, it is. It's oh, object okay. Relations theory. It is. Objects that's relation. Right. And you must connect with an object, which could be a person or a thing. And if you don't make that connection, you will have relationship trust issues when you become an adult. Got it. So we're going to say, so the, the theory does say it doesn't have to be a person, but for the test, we say a person. Okay. So what she says is that if you don't bond with that one person between the ages of two and three, that you will forever have difficulties. Okay. And when we talk about her, her theory, I'll pull it up. And you can look at it. Uh, when we talk about her theory, it really was written at the time when, um, um, like she was in Vienna, Austria at the time, and, and she was back in the Freudian day. So the babies that she were looking at were babies that were most often in the orphanage. Okay. So then her faces were normal autistic. And sometimes you'll see that called a fusion. Babies just lay there that first month of age. She had autistic before autism came about. Okay. Just, just those aren't related. She, she's like 1800s. I'm just saying, okay. So then the second stage is symbiosis. Symbiosis is when I, I realize I need this thing to live. I don't realize we're separate yet, but I know I need this thing to live. If you've tutored with me, I talk about the cheese in our refrigerator, right? The cheese and the mold don't have a conversation. They don't. But, you know, the mold won't grow unless the cheese is there for a little bit of time. And I'm not talking blue cheese that you eat. I'm talking like the cheese that I just forgot to throw away or maybe a pear or an apple or whatever, right? So that, so the mold won't grow unless that fruit is there or whatever that is. So that's what the baby just knows. I need this, this to live. It is not until between five and seven months the baby realizes it's a separate person from its mom, okay? So if you recall having babies or having grandchildren, that's when they'll be, you'll be nursing and they'll look around like, whoa, wait. So they really began to notice the world and notice that they're separate from their mother. Um, the hatching, I don't usually see that one on the test. Practicing is when they're beginning to walk. They're getting a little further away, but still not yet. Reproachment is between uh, 16 and 24 months. I usually say about 18 months. Babies can really walk, but they're not letting mom out of their sight yet, right? So where's mom? Where's mom? Where's mom? And then the last one, of course, is what we want to, and she's a neo-Freudian, right? Unconsciously. I need to know that I have a safe base. Someone always has my back. If I've had the consistent caregiver, but up until those ages between two and three, then I know no matter where I go in life, if I mess up, no matter what, someone's got my back. But if you don't learn that, she said that that's where that reactive attachment disorder comes from, right? Kids who are that, you know, burn their parents' house down with the kids in there. You'll see that a lot with kids who've been adopted and then they, they've never bonded with anybody. Um, uh, as you grow older, she said that borderlines come from that as well. Um, again, very black, very white. Love you, love you, love you. Hate you, hate you, hate you. And she also said conduct disorders come in there. Okay. Anybody watching the Dahmer series? Okay. No one wants to admit to raise their hand. I know. I know. Oh, oh I'm okay. watching. Okay. So, so. So that's the, so that's part of the problem, right? Mom was just not there. Dad thought somebody was there and he was, there was just no one there. Mm -hmm. So that's the theory is he just, there was never anyone to, for him to grow up that is the world to be a safe place. Okay. Um, I like this theory a lot because it, she really did it um, again in, in the early, late, late 1800s, like 1890s, to like in the early 1900s. Um, but I like it today when I really apply it to um, a lot of the clients I've seen in the past. So what I what I recognize is, uh, especially let's say that mom's a teen mom, she's 15, 16, has a baby. 
And everybody in the family is very supportive of mom and wants mom to finish school. So the baby stays with her mom for a couple of bits, right? And then his mom takes the baby and then my cousin takes the baby. And then, oh, by the way, then the, the, the daddy's gonna take the baby. And by the time the baby's two, they've had five or six different caregivers. Okay, and, and not with bad intention, right? The, the intention is let's mom finish school so, so mom can better her life. But what we don't understand is that damage that does because the baby has never had that one consistent caregiver. So again, fast forward, then that's why I see a lot of kids that um, are looking for that, that knowing that someone has their back. And many times I find that in gang activity. Because as a, as a kid, I, and I, I, you know, I know these people love me, but Margaret Mailer's theory said I had to have that one person that had my back. Okay. Does that answer your question? You can tell I like this theory a lot. I applied, I, I use this one a lot. I like this one that I, I use it often. I think it makes up. And I, and I don't think, I don't think parents ever, well, no, I don't. Very few parents purposely hurt their kids. Very few. So, but I do think it explains a lot of behaviors when mom is trying to go to school or, or in the drama series, dad was trying to, you know, better for the family and mom was just crazy. So, and, you know, untreated conduct disorders turn into what? Untreated conduct disorders. Jackie, you want to say it? Antisocial. Yes, my yes! serial killers. <laughs> I told you you are in my head. You are in my head. Uh, go ahead. Were you going to say something? Dr. Pam got a question. Uh -huh. uh, if, the, if, the, if the child has caregiver, has mom and dad, and then they have grandma and grandpa, and then they have another grandma and grandpa, and it keeps rotating between those, that means the child will. So, so, um, so Margaret Mailer said those first three years of life, the first between two and three, I need the, a consistent caregiver, the same consistent. person. It doesn't mean grandparents can't babysit, right? But mom can't drop the baby off for six months and then come back like nothing happened, according uh. to Mailer. Okay, right, that's according. Right. Remember, everybody has a theory. They're same as like bottoms. Right? Everybody has one. Okay. So, but that's one that I that I particularly really adhere to. That and Maslow. I, I really, really think those are really sound theories that I, I use a lot. And yes, remember, antisocials are not asocials. Asocials are people that don't want to hang around people. Antisocials do want to hang around you because they want to kill you and eat you. Put you in their refrigerator, open door and find a head. Sorry. <laughs> I was getting my hair done this week and my hairdresser's like 22. And she's watching the Dahmer series. And she's like, I didn't even realize this happened. I'm like, because you weren't born yet. And you're like, too young to even remember that this happens. <laughs> so Dr. Pam, I have a question. Yes. Um, with Margaret Mailer, did she, like you said, did she, did you, let me try to get it straight in my head. Did she mean, did you mean that um, she doesn't, it was different people taking care of the baby in the, like for a long period of time, like maybe two or three months at a time. And not just like, li you know, the baby living with like the mother and the grandmother and, you know, like all in one household. Okay. So, so I, I want to teach you the test. So we're not going to get that deep. The test is not going to get that deep. Okay. Okay. It's really about making sure, and I'm not trying to diagnose you and your children. So <laughs> just trying to say what the test says. Okay. Okay. The test just talks about particularly what she says is they need that one consistent caregiver. It doesn't have to be mom, dad, or it doesn't matter who it is, right. but that one person knowing no matter where I go in life, that no matter what happens unconsciously, somebody's got my back. Okay. I say I did a too good of a job of that because my children travel and live outside the country and get up on a plane like it's no big deal. They must know mom's got their back. I'm saying I should have like, you know, let them go straight with strangers now, <laughs> but that's her, that's her theory. And remember, everybody has theories, but when it comes to the test, according to Margaret Mailer, that's all that matters. Unless it says, according to Cynthia and her theory, it's only going to ask you, what does Margaret Mailer say? 
But while we're there, let's pick up on another theory of attachment, and that's you're going to see Ainsworth and Bobby, right? So Ainsworth and Bobby also talked about attachment. So what they talked about, and mainly, um, you'll see them both together. Um, and so Ainsworth's theory was those secure, insecure attachments. Okay, so what Ainsworth said, and this also happened in the 70s, and again, you can Google it, I mean, YouTube it, you can go back and watch the video of what it really looked like. Um, so this is where the moms dropped the babies off, and they were trying to measure the attachment style that mom had to the baby. And, you know, we can say dad, but, but um, when this was done, it was in the 70s, and the caregiver was mom. Okay, so I'm not sexist. I'm just, just sharing you studies. So email me later and say, I'm a man. I'm raising my kids. That's nice, but don't tell me that. Okay, so the secure attachment, those are the ones that when I drop the baby off, the baby knows that mom's coming back and is not worried at all. It shall cry for a moment. That's the video if you actually want to go back and watch the video. Okay, but what happens is they will cry. They're, they're comforted by the caregiver. And then when mom comes back, they're so happy to see mom and it works out well for everybody. Okay. And then my insecure avoidance, those are the babies that when mom cries, she's unresponded, uncaring, dismissive. So again, mom drops the baby off, caregiver, the kid is not upset whatsoever, doesn't acknowledge when the caregiver returns um, and doesn't care about the teacher is kind of used to being avoided, okay? Ambivalent, that's the one that is your, you respond to the child inconsistently. Distress when the caregiver leaves, mom drops me off, I'm really upset. When mom comes back, I'm not comforted by her return, okay? Those three are by Ainsworth. Now, I have seen a test question in a study guide that asks about the fourth one. It's another Mary, but it's not Mary Ainsworth. So if you ever see that question about the fourth one, it's still a Mary, but it's not one of our Ainsworth, Ainsworth's original um, theories. This one is more drug related. So it might have a disorganized attachment, abusive, neglectful. I respond in frightening ways. I never know what mom's going to do. Then when mom comes back, right, she drops me off. I'm not attached to anybody. I, I walk around being confused all the time. And when mom comes back, I'm still just as confused. So all of you mommies and daddies that dropped your babies off at daycare and they cried, you did good because they had a secure attachment. And when you came to pick them up, they were happy to see you. So that's Ainsworth and you'll see Ainsworth and Bobby together. That's the other attachment people. Who else, guys? Nobody? Okay. Let me pull up some questions here. Um, people were asking earlier about the pocket prep, the behavioral health app. Um, I I do like it. I do like it, but I will tell you this is not studying. Okay, so people will swear that that 90% on pocket prep and they're ready for the test and that's not studying. Okay, so you can, the, the test, uh, the first time you type the questions, it's valid, but after that, it's not valid, right? Because you know the answers, you've seen the questions before. So while you might be getting a consistent score, it is definitely not reliable. Okay, um, so I own most of them because I teach to most of the tests. So you'll see the uh, MFT, EPPP, blah, 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 blah. So this is the one that um, most people will purchase. Again, I it's the same as the Helwig book. Um, I my my pastor said to me one time that um, um, not to me in, in general, but to the the congregation is that like so the things that we do on our phone really aren't that important. So like you know you can read your Bible on your phone, but you can also watch porn. Just saying, that's what he said. So the problem I find is when most of us do things on our phone, we do it very quickly. We're doing it like five minutes in the grocery store. We're doing it like, you know, right before we go to bed. And we're really, the same way we're checking our TikToks and our Facebook. And we're really not paying attention to it. 
So if you're going to do it, then use it right. Okay, so when you do it, you know, do the 10, the question of the day or do 10 questions. I do like it a lot when it comes to studying and I'm just gonna show you what the NCE looks like. Okay, so when you, as you're doing it, you can, first of all, you get the question of the day. Okay, and I, I don't know the price. I'm not going to lie. I, I have all of them and I've had them forever. So I, I don't, I'm not going to lie. Okay, so those are, you get the question of the day. And when you check your answer, it'll give you where it comes from. So that's what you want to do is you want to go back and make sure you understand where it comes from if you missed the question. So this tells you it comes from the Hellwig book, right? The ninth chapter on what page? And also it comes from the purple book. So that's where we go back and you would find more information on this particular theorist. What so, is this cool. called, Dr. Pam? This is, uh, it's called the Behavioral Health App. I am not recommending it. Someone asked earlier about it and I'm just sharing what it looks like. Okay. Um, so having Hurst, who was he? Think careers. He has the um, large crisis. Say again, he what? Uh, I lost you, so I'm not really sure what you said. Okay, but Habits Hurst is, he really is, um, he's known for my, my non directional question. Okay, so he said that, so, that in careers that it wasn't a decision. You didn't make a decision. So he's a developmentalist, so you might see him. Hold on, we need everybody, guys. Okay. So you might see him in early, uh, the early human development part. You might see him there as well. But he is known as my developmental guy. In career, he is known as my non-decision making. So he also said, like, we don't need the SDS, like the Holland's test, career pattern inventory, the super test, career belief inventory that belongs to Krumbaltz. We didn't need all that stuff, right? He said that we develop naturally into these things. So what we do as little kids, like zero to five, learn to walk and talk, middle childhood, adolescence, okay, middle school. Those are just normal behaviors. That's what we do as we watch people around us. So between the ages of 18 and 35, we choose a life partner, we establish our family, take care of a home, and establish our career. No choices, no inventories, no trait and factor. He did, He said it was not a decision. This is just what you do. Okay. So if you're studying with us, and normally, well, again, we're always going to use the Hellwig book. We, that's our absolute favorite. So any of our my staff will. Um, that's what we use. Uh, we're gonna when you do the book, you're really going to kind of go through the book, and especially if we look at the helping professions. Let me pull that back up. Are we supposed to be seeing your screen, Dr. Pam? Um, not this right. Did you not see the Having's Her Sky? No. I'm so sorry. Let me go back. Thank you for saying something. I have Having Her on page 27 in uh, Hellwick. Uh, thank you. I'm not going to quite do that one, but I just want to show you the theory. So that's what it looks like um, for those of you that like pictures and color pictures. See it? So he, again, so you might just see him under human development and you might also see him under careers. Under careers, he's known as the non-decisional non guy because he said you don't make a decision about a career. You just grow up and that's what you do. And you also might see him then in an early in human behavior because again, he said we this is how we develop. So same thing in the Hellwick book, it just doesn't have a cute picture. So between 18 and 35, that's just what you do in that time of life. Okay. So non-decisional guy when we see him in Hellwig in the career section. Developmental theorist when we see him in the early chapters. 
Well, and Dr. Pam, mm -hmm. he also says that you have to master the task in each developmental stage before maturing to the next stage. Do I have that? Um, that's not going to be a task question. The only okay. time you're ever going to see that is Erickson. Erickson okay. is the lifespan guy, and Erickson said you cannot go on because you get stuck or fixated in the earlier stages, right? Okay. Okay. So when you're studying, if you're not using, if you're not with one of my tutors, we're definitely going to say when it comes to the helping professions, um, this is one of the really, really meaty chapters. And, and really break it down into very individual pieces and really kind of understand what each therapist would say and knowing their vocabulary. So existentialism is Viktor Frankl, right? He talked about why do we exist? What is our purpose? He's the one that grew up in the, he was in the Nazi concentration camp, not grew up. Well, he did grow up there actually. Um, so he was, um, he did not grow up there. He was already a doctor when he got sent there. So, so he was in the Nazi concentration camp. He talked about why do I exist? What is my purpose? Whenever I think of his name, um, I think of, uh, of the Purpose Driven Life, right? That, that book. Um, logotherapy is a different term that you might see him use. Logotherapy is the name of his book. And he, so he used that. So whenever you see logotherapy, remember that it's interchangeable with, with um, Viktor Frankl. My other existential that you might see, Rollo May is one, but he's not a real biggie. But the one that you might see is Yalom, right? My curative, my curative factor is that guy. You really might see Yalom. Um, he is a um, existentialist. So those curative factors, one of those is existential. And like, why am I here? What is my purpose? And in group, that helps you find your bigger purpose in life. So that's a term that you would see Yalom use. Okay. So again, so am I sharing? Okay. If you don't have this book and you would like this book, um, you may feel free to send an email to my staff and someone will make sure of it. Again, if you're, um, it's cheaper to buy. Okay. We talked about Freud, my id, ego, and super ego. Remember, my it is my pleasure principle. Uh-oh. Born with it, eat, sleep, and procreate. Eat, sleep, and have sex. That's all I want to do all day, every day. Eat, sleep, and have sex. My super ego says, don't you dare, Pam. Never, 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 never have sex. Never, never, never. Freud said my it is innate. I'm born with it. He said society wouldn't go on if I didn't have my it. Okay? The reality principle is me. And that is going to be our ego. Ego defense mechanisms, ego ego syntonic, ego dystonic. That's me. So me, I'm trying to always keep down my id and my superego. It's a balancing game, right? Sometimes my devil wins, just saying. My superego very rarely wins. I know, it's that, that's just me. Sorry, God made me that way. <laughs> so my, yeah, I'm trying to keep that id down. No, no, <laughs> okay. There are many people that struggle with your superego, right? Because you always want to do the right thing. You probably got some OCPD going on. It's just a compulsive personality disorder. I'm not one of them. My id, keep it down, bam. The devil so, made me do it. That's where that term comes from. That's my id. Okay, Dr. Pam, so would you say the ego is the one trying to balance the id and the super ego? I think that's what I just said. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I must have missed that part. Mm -hmm. Don't take notes. Just listen. You'll miss it. <laughs> so, yes. I'm not writing. I'm not writing. It went out. Yes. My ego is the reality principle and it's gotcha. me, it's me. So me, and I can tell you me personally, my mm -hmm. ego struggles to keep my id down. That's gotcha. my id wants to eat everything in the house. It wants to, I'm single, it wants to sleep with everybody I see, right? That's, that's my, it wants to sleep all day. That's the, that. okay. My ego is like, Pam, girl, you know, you a mama, you a doctor, you hate me doing that stuff. You got to come home at night. So I don't struggle with the super ego. I, I don't struggle with that part <laughs> i wish i did <laughs> okay the super ego says you'll grow hair on your palms if you play with yourself any catholic school kids that's what the nun said right don't touch that don't grow hairy palms so okay. should i not be taking notes no you should not <laughs> <laughs> And I'm sorry I didn't oh. mention that before. I usually just speak way too fast. I'm trying to brain dump. 
and you will miss what I'm saying if you take notes. Uh, you get a video of this and you will get it and slow it down and watch it 17 times. And literally, I really mean Oh, so know. we get a recording of this after? You do. I, well, I this is my first you. one. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I am so sorry. How are you? I'm all right. Thanks. I didn't even <laughs> introduce myself. I am so sorry, Unique. I am Dr. Payne. How are you doing? I'm okay. I'm okay. Sunday morning live? here. South Where Korea. Oh, wow. Why? I work at an international school here as a school counselor. Uh huh. So it's fun. Very, very cool. Very cool. How long have you been there? Three years. And and did you just decide South Korea or you had other choices? I I've been abroad since 2016. So I started mm -hmm. in China and mm -hmm. then yeah, I was I taught in China just, for a while. Yeah. Yeah. So I ended up here just. COVID happened and then borders mm -hmm. closed and then I'm like all right let's go to South Korea I was actually trying to get out of Asia but <laughs> here I am but this is going to be my last yeah, year that's, here that's, and I plan to go somewhere else that's never been on my list never ever ever South Korea never sorry <laughs> never cool though. it's literally just like America <laughs> but with a bunch of Asian people walking around. Um, um so I uh, my children we, we travel a lot so my we're a very multicultural family um, so my son and his wife were, she's Swiss and they were living in Bali for that stuck in, in Bali, um, during the middle of COVID. Um, and yes, um, yeah, a bunch of like people that are, you know, Asian, but you know, my son is like a six, like five black man. He didn't really blend in <laughs> in Asia. So, <laughs> and his, my, my daughter-in-law is Swiss and she's like, she's like five, nine too. Like, and most of the Asian people like just they couldn't find clothes it didn't work out well for them so how about you yeah it's hard to find clothes even when you're not you know they're very slim here mm -hmm. yeah and um like no bodies so <laughs> it's hard to yeah. find clothes so i'll like order on amazon and have it sent and have to wait a long time and stuff like that so they ended up using a tailor most of the time. They found it was just a lot cheaper to find the material and just get someone to make it for them because that was because it was ridiculous. And and in Bali, Amazon didn't deliver. I tried. <laughs> I sent them stuff, but no. <laughs> very very cool, very cool, very cool. Um, um, I I I worked in China for a bit. I taught um, um, English to. Um, um, mainly kids trying to get into international schools or international colleges. So very cool. Very cool. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So yes, you do get a recording of this. And if you don't have this book, you will just ask for it in the recording. So you do have to ask for this. If you send an email to drpam, drpam2020 at gmail.com. Prudence is the business. Jill works on the weekends. She's the, our weekend person. Um, Prudence is the, the brain of the operation. She takes care of the billing and sending things out. Um, all I want to do is teach. All I want to do is teach. And I could care less if you pay me or not, but kind of the rest of the staff likes to get paid and stuff. So Prudence, uh, make sure that you pay your bills. Okay, <laughs> so back to my, my issue. So my Neo-Freudians, like I said, they don't believe in the in the sex part, not the id and ego and super ego. I don't spend a lot of time on them. Karen Horney, she is most often you're going to see her with those women. So all the feminist theories, right? We talk about like um, um, uh, Carol Gilligan, anytime um, Chudro, Nancy Chudro, they're all part of that feminist movement. Okay. Margaret Mailer, of course, she was my object relations theory. Okay. Person centered, that's Carl Rogers. Carl Rogers did not believe in diagnosing. He said the client was the expert. He purposely came along after Freud because Freud said he was the expert. And Carl Rogers said, uh uh uh, let me show you. The client's the expert. So he said, as long as the therapist, we were congruent, what's coming out of my mouth matches what my body is doing. When all of those things match up, I'm warm, I'm genuine, the client can figure it out by themselves. Okay. So not diagnosing. That term feminological, that's all that means is the client's phenomenon, the way the client sees the world. Okay. So when we look at using this theory, this would not be a theory that we're using with drug and alcohol users, right? I'm not going to accept their fem feminological choices to keep drinking and my pedophiles keep touching kids. Uh-uh. Right? Many times we'll see those questions of like, which theory to use? 
this is not one that you're going to use with, with kids and, and Carl, you're not going to use that one, Carl Rogers. Pearl, Fritz Pearls, of course, he is my complete gestalt. Get rid of my unfinished business, stay in the here and now. Um, T.A., that is um, um, Bernay, Alfred Bernay. Uh, He's got the three ego states, okay? Rollo May and Victor Frankel, like I said, y'all, those are the ones that you'll see for existentialism. He talked about anxiety and guilt. We struggle for our meaning. Right? Anxiety and guilt are the central concepts. The threat of not being is when we fail to fulfill our potential. And remember, he's the one that was in the concentration camp, right? So where he really wanted to like, God, why did you save me? Why am I here? And, and what does that look like? Okay, his book was Logotherapy. Uh, I'm not going to get into the behaviors, guys, because I usually talk about them separately. DBT, Marsha Linehan, that was definitely for borderlines only. So she's the first person that really looked at a uh, therapy that teaches, that treated our personality disorders. We often don't see anything to treat those because they are so ingrained. They are very much who we are. So I'm going to use a different test one. I like this one a lot. Um, if you tutored with me before, you've probably seen me use it. And if you know the answers, don't answer. I'd like to see how it applies. Oh, okay. So then do not answer yet. Okay. So this is this is a code of ethics question, actually. And when it comes to the code of ethics, the code of ethics says when I am seeing a couple or, or a family, there are no secrets. I can't keep the secret and I can't share the secret either. Okay. So wife tells me she's a lesbian and the husband asks me in the middle of session. So are you a lesbian, Pam? I don't, or the wife, I can't say yes or no, right? I can't do that. They're both my clients. Okay. So Dan, let's see here. Taylor, your screen open. Yes, it is. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So remembering it's a reading test. Okay. So uh, no one answer, please. Hold your thoughts. No checkbox okay. answers. Hold the thought. This is just Taylor. Unless he asks for help, then you can chime in. So when it comes to managing crisis issues in therapy, what is the best explanation for having a no secrets policy? So no secrets doesn't just apply to couples. It applies to general what secrets we can and we cannot keep. Correct. Okay. Uh, so it says, A, it guides your general standard of therapy while explicitly describing legal uh, ex exceptions. Uh, B, it guides the right ethical behavior for how you divulge information. Uh, C, it guides therapists into knowing how and when to intervene with certain issues. D, you got, uh, it guides families and couples to understand how your confidentiality works. What's the question well, asking me? So it's based, it's asking uh, the, the no secrets policy, um, having a no secrets policy and uh, I guess transfer, uh, a transformer of information between. Whoa, 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 whoa. read that top uh, line. Read that top line again. It says when it comes to managing crisis issues ah, and therapy. Okay. So that's, that's different, right? So now it's a crisis. Right. Right. So that's right, right. part. It's a reading test. OK, so now. So uh, I'm going to go into uh, break down my eliminate my two. OK, um, like, uh, your general standard of therapy while uh, explicitly describing legal, et cetera. So I'm going to start a because it has that word legal in it, legal exceptions. OK, um, so I'm going to go to B. Uh, it says it guides the right ethical behavior for how you divulge information. So you're always supposed to be ethical in your behavior. So we're going to cross off B. Um, everything should be transparent when it comes to a crisis or divulge information. Kind of, it's kind of hesitant. So we're going to cross off B. Uh, C, it guides therapists into knowing how and when to intervene with certain uh, situations. I'm going to start that one and come back to it. And D, um, it guides families and couples to, to understand how your confidentiality works. Um, it guides families and couples. Uh, 
I am going to choose, well, I'm going to get rid of C. Uh, I'm well, yeah, I'm going to mark through C. So B and C are off. Um, my choice is between A and D. Um, the guys, families, and couples do understand how your confidentiality works. Um, what is the, when it comes to managing crisis issues and therapy, what is the best explanation? I'm going to go with A, uh, due to the fact because of the legal exceptions. Yeah, they got my bill. I've been waiting. <laughs> Yay! <it is. laughs> Everybody say how we got there. That's a tough question. Why you pick me? Because you know this stuff, Tara. Oh, no, that's true. Well, okay. <laughs> Everybody, any questions on how we got there? Because that, that was a tough one, right? Why not D? Is there, are they in crisis? Do you think families, how they got their confidentiality? That would have been if it didn't talk about managing a crisis. Mm. So what the question is really asking me, when you're telling me you're going to kill yourself or somebody else, we all got those secrets, do we? No. That's what the question is asking me. So, I, and they're, they're going to be that vague. You're not going to get like, according to the code of ethics, 3.216 on this page, what do you do? So that's what it's talking about. It's managing crisis and having a no secret. So when you come into me, when we set up that informed consent, you are aware that not, I cannot keep everything a secret, right? If you tell me you're going to go and hurt somebody else, imminent harm, right? imminent danger, you're going to hurt yourself or somebody else. I have to tell you that. I have to report that. If you tell me that you're going to go and rob a bank, I cannot tell anybody that. If you tell me that you're going to go shoot the bank guy or you're robbing the bank, <laughs> I can tell you how to report that, right? Um, but it's not property. It's not past. It's imminent danger. Okay. Questions? Yeah, Dr. Pam, what are you using right now? What is uh, um, this? Is, uh, this is pocket prep, but it's the marriage and family therapy version. I like, I, I will use different questions. Sometimes I use social work questions. Um, I just want you to see it differently, the same content, just a different way. So when you get to the test, if it's written different than you've always seen it, you'll still understand the question. And don't buy it. Oh my gosh, don't spend any more money. Please don't spend any more money. <laughs> I just got the hell with book. Goodness. I'm not a fan. I just, I'm not a fan. I just think that people have tons and tons of material. They just really don't know... Um, uh, what to do with it. I like this one. Dr. Mayor, can we do the I statement one? Say again, the I statement one? Well, one where the answer choice was the I statement. Um, I will not, but I'll ask you what I statement is. Okay. Or, uh, is like that's what I was, uh, I don't know. I'm having a brain fart this week. Okay. I don't know. I right. so, so I statements are um, many times, especially in couples therapy or marriage as well, um, when I am describing how your behavior makes me feel. Mm -hmm. So you know what? When, when, when your spouse comes home late and you're mad at them, you're like, oh my God, I can't believe you came home late. What's wrong with you? Blah, blah, blah. Your spouse gets defensive. Whoa. But to mm -hmm. say, I am worried when you come home late. So it talks about your feelings and how their behavior makes you feel. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's a nice So idea. when we was going back to um, um, our choice theory, because isn't I statements isn't that done also in cognitive Aaron Beck cognitive behavior therapy? It doesn't belong to anybody, so it can it can be anyone can use it. Okay, because I, okay, I, so, I yeah, I was, that it's was not bad. tied to it's not tied to any specific theorist. Okay. All right. Let me get that. One. No one gets to take credit for that one. Sorry. Okay. I said that. Remember, it, it, we're in the textbook. According to Dr. Pam, no, no. It's no one, no particular theorist gets that one. Okay. So, oh, uh, let's see here. Uh, who wants this one? I'll do it. Look at you, Tyler. Go ahead. It says you are working with James, a fifty-year-old man, who states all the symptoms of erectile dysfunction as a marriage and family therapist your next course of should be okay, so just put counselor um, in there we're gonna go back to the question 
Okay. Um, so the question is asking, um, states that he still had, I guess he still, he has all the symptoms of erectile dysfunction. So uh, the next course is asking James if he wants, or A, asking James if he wants to work on his erectile dysfunction as a therapy treatment goal. B, referring, to Jan, uh, referring James to a sex therapist to help improve his erectile dysfunction symptoms. C, encouraging James to discuss this issue with his doctor or provide an, in a, uh, provide an appropriate referral to a doctor. D, uh, discussing how James has worked on his erectile dysfunction. I guess it's in the past. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so we can, I'm going to go through there and knock off two, um, I guess, provide an appropriate referral. I mean, you're the counselor, so you can't always revert to uh, referring, referring out. Um, so I, I would agree on this question, but remember, if it's something that's out of your scope, then you mm -hmm. would either seek supervision or refer. Okay. But I, I, that would not be the first thing I would do. Okay. So I can't cross out C or <laughs> Because I, I don't think it's C because it's referred. I mean, if they're going to ask you in the question, it's not, I mean, it's stating mm -hmm, what. Mm -hmm. So we're always going to rule out medical first. Always, always. So if someone comes in and they, they don't have enough yeah. symptoms to quite meet a diagnosis, um, if, if they, you know, if they're having panic attacks, before we treat a panic attack, we're going to make sure they're not really having heart issues. So we're always mm -hmm. going to rule out medical first. Yeah. Okay. And we, we can't write a script for a little blue pill. I, we can't do that. So yeah. he needs to go see his doctor. Just saying there's $75 a pill. I, not that I know that because I'm single, <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to really stop talking. <laughs> Remember, I have, I have no life, <laughs> no life whatsoever. Your guys are all I have. And my dogs don't talk back. <laughs> so really, whenever there's a medical issue, we're always going to rule out. And we also know that Prozac, one of the side effects of Prozac is sexual dysfunction, a difficulty with uh, reaching orgasm. Um, but still, even though we know that, that's still out of our scope of expertise. We're always going to refer those to a doctor. Always, always. Okay. okay. Dr. Kenny's question is kind of hard. <laughs> Goodness gracious. I hope they make you so prepared. Okay, who wants this one? Anybody but Taylor. Did you hear that in school, Taylor? <laughs> I'll take I it. I did. I'll take it. Who said that? Me. Uh, I, I, I don't see 13184. I know, but I don't see. I hear with my eyes. Oh, I didn't know the video went on. Is that your prison number? I don't know why it comes. <laughs> I feel like, hang on. I'm sorry. I don't know. <laughs> Go okay. Um, Susie is a therapist who works in a small rural town where she is the only mental health provider. She receives a referral to work with a client who she quickly discovers is her son's teacher. Ethically, ethically, what is the best course of action Susie should take? I can't right, see the C and D. Oh, hold on, but understand the question, okay. right? Rural town. Okay. okay. So this okay. is ethically, but I'm, my thought is I'm, they're looking at like dual relationships, right? Things like that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. now I'm looking at my choices. Okay. So A, agree to work with the client after asking if she can transfer her son to a different teacher. B, agree to work with the client after assessing that the client is in an acute crisis. Refuse to work with the client on the grounds that they have an existing relationship. And D, agree to work with the client after thoroughly discussing the risks, benefits, and potential ethical issues associated with a multiple relationship. Okay, so like you said, at first, the person is talking about a rural town uh -huh. and the counselor is her son's teacher. She's the, the therapist. only mental health. The only mental health. Okay. I will rule out A, 
agree to work with the client after asking if she can transfer her son to a different teacher. That doesn't even sound right. I don't think. Um, B, agree to work with the client after assessing that the client is in an acute crisis. I don't agree with that. Do you know why? There's nothing in this question about acute crisis, is there? Right. So that right. cannot be my answer. There's nothing in right. there that says that. So that cannot be my answer. Good. Okay. C, refuse to work with the client on the grounds that they have an existing relationship. I will hold that one. And D, agree to work with the client after thoroughly discussing the risks, benefits, and potential ethical issues associated with the multiple relationship. Okay. I know that you can have an existing relationship, you know, with the person, but then again, since she's the only one there in the town, you can kind of like the D says, thoroughly discuss the risk benefits and potential ethical issues associated with the multiple relationship. Since she's the only one there, I would go with D. Absolutely. 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 My only choice. So remember, dual relationships are sometimes unavoidable. Right. We're trying to mm -hmm. do everything we can to do that. If there were other therapists in town, I'd refer, but I'm the only one. OK. Remember also bartering. This is the only time you can barter. Most often it's going to be in a small town where everybody else takes chickens. Right. You can you can take chickens for services if the doctor, lawyer, dentist all take chickens. The client has to ask for it first, though. So I didn't mention feminist therapy. Feminist therapy is also called gender fair. So it used to be just for women. It's no longer just for women. It is for anyone that doesn't have power. LGBTQI. Um, so it really is looking at making a more of an egalitarian um, world. The thought with gender fair, F-A-I-R, or feminist therapy is the fact that what is personal is political. So if I come in as a woman of color, being a part of the minority community, and I come in and say that I'm depressed, a feminist therapist person would look at the bigger society. It's not that I am depressed. It's like the society is oppressing me. So the thought, the thought is always looking about changing the bigger picture. So to empower people that don't have power. Okay, Jasmine, take this one for me. Um, when it comes to supporting men, one of the key goals of feminist family therapy is supporting them to empower women, supporting them to dismantle the patriarchy, supporting them to become more aware and attuned to their emotions, supporting them to become more assertive when establishing power. So the question is, it's a family therapy, right? You're using a feminist approach in a family setting. So how would I work with men? What, 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 sorry, when it comes to supporting men? So if we're working with men, are we thinking that supporting them to empower women? Mm, I don't think that's what we're looking at right now. I like that answer, but it's probably not right. Yeah. I'm just saying all women just, I'm just, you know. That's... You're right. <laughs> <laughs> According to Pam Turner therapy. <laughs> <laughs> As you say, you know. <laughs> okay. And like you said, this is a test and that's not what they're going <laughs> to, that's not going to be that. No, um, not. Supporting them to dismantle the patriarchy. Um, I don't believe it's that also. Um, what are they talking about the patriarchy? Are they talking about supporting them? About the, the male um, the fact that in society that we're still mainly run by white males. So white that means so that patriarchy, that's what that means. Yes. Okay. Supporting them to become more aware and attuned to their emotions or supporting them to become more assertive when establishing power. So I'm going to rule out D and I'm going to go with C, supporting them to become more aware and attuned to their emotions. Look at me. <laughs> yes, 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 right? Okay, so it's not about like dismantling the man, male revolution. It's not about that. It's right. really more of an egalitarian gender fair um, that, that you know, men don't have to be the tough guys, mm -hmm. right? And men put on this tough guy act.
act because of what society says or how that, you know, the society says you should behave. Exactly. Good job. Very good job. Very good job. So feminist therapy remembers not, it did start with women. It's still for women, but it's not only about women anymore. And you'll see gender fair as, as opposed to that anymore. I'll do that one. Um, that, that, that one. Trying to pick up some of my theorists. Let's do this one. Um, Angelina, you look like you want to answer a question. Okay. <clears throat> You are working with Christine, a single mother and her daughter, Molly. You believe that continuing family therapy is the best approach for their specific needs. Their insurance does not cover family sessions, but it does provide reimbursement for individual sessions. To mitigate financial stress, you submit a claim for individual psychotherapy while continuing to see them as a family. What legal issue is most pertinent in this case? Okay. okay what's happening in the question? All right, so we're working with a um, uh, mother and a daughter, um, single mom and a daughter, um, but they they need to continue going on to therapy, to continue going to the therapy, but their insurance is not going to cover any more family sessions, or does not cover family sessions, um, but it does provide reimbursement for individual sessions. Okay, so it's only the insurance is only going to allow you to see them for individuals. Okay, to mitigate financial stress, you submit a claim for individual psychotherapy while continuing to see them as a family. Okay. Um, okay, we can get rid of A, okay. um, and we can get rid of D. Okay. Um, I want to say it's B. <laughs> okay. That is insurance fraud. That's and the T there was legal. The legal term. You will go to jail for insurance fraud. Remember, like career counseling is something that is not covered. You cannot bill your client for anxiety or give him a DSM daughter of anxiety right. and be giving him career counseling. That is insurance fraud. That is not unethical. It is illegal. It's unethical too. But you will go to jail for that. Okay. You know how I feel about jail. Not peeing in front of anybody. Can't be doing that. Let's try this one. We didn't study structural family therapy, but remember structural family therapy is Mnuchin. Mnuchin talks about hierarchies. He talks about boundaries, enmeshed, disengaged. Those terms belong to Mnuchin. Karen, why don't you take this one for me? A structural family therapist is in an eating with a family every week for two months. On the ninth session, the father blurts out that he is incredibly frustrated with his wife for always siding with their teenage daughter. At this point, the therapist would next intervene by. Okay, we got inviting the family to complete a genogram together, focusing on creating a functioning spousal subsystem dismantling the enmeshed boundaries between the mother and daughter, empowering the father to set his own boundaries with his daughter. With his no, wife. It's Go not ahead. A, why not? Because the genogram has nothing to do with how they're getting along. Who does it belong to? It belongs to the whole family. No, genogram belongs to what theorist? Anybody? Oh, Lauren. Well, Bowen, Bowen, Gina Graham. So, okay, we talked about, and Bowen might be considered a structural family therapist, but this doesn't talk anything about inner generations, right? So I know that that can't be my answer. Okay. okay? So the ninth session, and finally the father says he's, he's incredibly frustrated with his wife because she always sides with the teenage daughter. Okay. Because it's an issue of boundaries. Focusing on creating a functional spousal subsystem, I would rule that one out. Dismantling the enmeshed boundaries between the mother and the daughter. I would go with empowering the father to set his own boundaries with his daughter. Is he having issues with his daughter? No, he's having issues with the mother. So I can't, I don't know if I could support D in the answer. Okay, so then it would have to be C. Nope. <laughs> Do you see why? <laughs> 
Remember, in a family, in family systems, any structural therapy, mom and dad are supposed to be at the top. Mom and dad are supposed to be on the same page. Y'all can argue behind the back about well, what happened with the kids, but in, in the front, mom and dad are supposed to be in, uh, in charge. Don't they have their own subsystem? The mother and the father, and then the kid. Oh, yeah. I think Dr. Pam is frozen. I think so too. Yeah, definitely. Sorry, it bumped me out. So it must be telling me something. It's time for me to go, right? Um, let me go back to that question. You see my screen? Yes. So the issue with structural family therapy is who's at the top? So in a healthy family, according to structural family therapy, is mom and dad are supposed to be in their own healthy subsystem and children are below them. So Mnuchin talked about joining the family. So mom and dad, right, should be their own subsystem. Together, they make the decisions to, to um, involve the child. So you're supposed to fight with, with mom and dad each other, but the mom and dad are the people in charge, according to Mnuchin and structural family therapy. Okay, make sense? Yes, ma'am. Try that one. Um, who wants this one? You want to share? Do you see Haley? Um, go ahead. Um, who raised their hand? Go ahead. I just... oh. Go ahead. Hey, um... Haley struggles with depression. In one of your first session, she expresses that she believes nobody understands her. As a cognitive behavioral therapist, you might best intervene by. CBT, back, back says change the way that you think, change the way that you feel, therefore change the way that you behave. Okay. So A, engage in genogram about her family history of depression. B, externalizing a depression from herself. C, providing psychoeducation about the cognitive distortion of dichotomous thinking. D, explore an exception to discover how she might have felt under the understood in the past. We so, know it ain't A. No. Right. <laughs> but A's out. Exactly. So we can eliminate A. Okay. The next thing, because we're asking for her as a cognitive behavior therapist, you might mm -hmm. intervene by externalizing her depressive from herself. You don't want to do that. So we can eliminate B. And then I'm um, exploring the exception of discovering how she might felt, how she may have felt and felt understood. In the past, you want to eliminate that. So I will go with C, provide psychoeducation about the um, cognitive disorders and dichotomous thinking. Everybody see that? CBT. So dichotomous thinking is the black and white thinking. So he's trying to change her thought process. Okay. Okay. Who does B belong to? What therapist would say externalize the depression from yourself? 
Remember, I talked about it today. It's by Michael White, but you would need to know that. Um, narrative therapy. Yeah. Yes. Give me the bell. Give me the bell. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. That's knowing your verbiage, right? Because that's what narrative therapy would say. Externalize that. Get that out of your head. Take it out. Rewrite it. Yes. Very good. So to understand how important it is to know each of theorist's vocabulary. Everybody has something that they would say. Okay. Good job on that. Very good. Both of you. Dr. PM, I have one question and I uh -huh. did it the last time, but I kind of forgot. Um, so they go back and watch the video. No, no, no. <laughs> and, I, and I have it in my notes. I just, I want to see if I got it right. So the difference between REBT, which is Albert Ellis and CBT. Mm -hmm. um, it's not near a lot, but go ahead. <laughs> so REBT is um, the ABCDE of thinking. Got it. And then CBT um, is cognitive behavioral thinking. So, so, think so REBT, he uses the words irrational belief system. So what is challenging, it's not the event that was the problem. It was the belief about the event that causes the problem. Right. And in CBT, um, in CBT, he's thinking about cognitive behavior it's the so, behavior so it's not so beck said that the pressure is not even real so what he's trying to do is to help you restructuring your thoughts to okay. say why do you think that way that that that's that's not even that that depression was stinking thinking that's all it said okay okay, okay. i'm not going to answer this question but solution focused therapy what words would i look for guys Mm. exception miracle question miracle question you woke up tomorrow Kelly, and the question was scaling. gone yeah so miracle question ex uh, or or accept question and scaling absolutely lisa absolutely that is required. the aha moment also a part of that um no that's not doesn't really belong to anybody so you you could say that but i don't think you'll say as a test question Go back to this one. Diagnosis question. Acute stress disorder. Anybody, how do we diagnose it? Uh, it has to be, I think it's the symptoms are uh, B. It has to be within from three days to one month, right? And after one month, after one month, what does it turn into? PTSD. Yikes! What is your test? Uh, I take it uh, at the end of November. <laughs> Are you excited? No, I, I feel like I'm going to throw up every day. Oh, no, no, no. Be excited. Be excited. You get to show the test what I, you want, what you know. Dr. Pam, I take mine on the 10th of October. Are you ready? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want an I don't know answer. We want to go in with I'm I know. Out. I tell you, I tell you, I'm burnt out. I'm I'm just studying, 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 and I take the practice practice test and I do 67%, um, sometimes 73%. It's like up in that range. Um are you working with one of my know. coaches? I was, yeah. Then they went out for vacation and then it was this Labor Day, and then I haven't got rescheduled yet. Um, so uh, email prudence, if you don't get in with somebody soon, then put her, have her put you on my schedule. Okay. If you're, if you're flexible, I have like this much time yeah. space. So if you're flexible, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> like between, uh, eight, and, no, it's like this is much free space. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. I just tell her that Dilla Pam said, and then she'll call me. Okay. And I'll say, I didn't say that. What are you talking about? <laughs> okay. Pro bono. What's the rule about pro bono guys? Do we give our services for free? No. no to an agency no. to a community but never to a person hurricane I and Ian is out there right if you want to go and donate and do some crisis counseling do whatever you want to do in your mental health field that's pro bono 
go for it. We do not give our sessions to clients for free. Never, 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 never. Remember your doctor. You go see your doctor and you say, I don't have any money today. He's going to say, get to step in. Okay. So remember that. Pro, we do, I don't care what your agency says. I don't care what you do in the real life. For the, and personally, well, in real life, don't give your stuff for free. For free. That's, that's, that's not valuing what you do. So don't do that. Just don't do that. Dr. Oh. Just, uh -huh. just for my, oops, sorry. Okay. My camera is on. <laughs> Are you saying do no, um, I should understand. Don't ever like give services? Never for free, ever, never, never. So like a victim of the, uh, of Ian, someone that has nothing. Okay, so that's different. That's so, so, okay, let's back up, okay? Mm -hmm. So then, and you're as pro bono. So what you do in your personal business is up to you. Mm -hmm. If you're wearing your therapist hat, what you're good at is counseling, crisis counseling, grief counseling. So if you went down to Florida or South Carolina and set up a little table and offered to see the people in the community for free because they've gone through a crisis, that's fine. That's what pro bono means. Okay. It's not a client that you're currently seeing or a client who comes in and says, I don't have any money. Can you see me? Okay. Okay. So, so value what you do. So, I mean, you, you can watch right now. I mean, there, there are doctors that have gone down there. There are nurses, there are people that are chefs that their own restaurants that have gone down there to give their services for free. That's pro bono. That, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. But when a client comes to their office, if they cannot afford to pay me, I can offer them a sliding scale. So if I normally charge, you know, two twenty-five an hour, I can I can say I can do one fifty an hour. If we both agree, that's fine. But if they cannot afford what I need to live, then they need to go to community mental health, which is not a bad thing. Biden ain't forgiven my loans yet, so I, I you got to pay me. <laughs> it depends. What about a pre-existing client? <laughs> no. Okay. No, 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 no. If he's in a crisis, yes. Hmm. But if he says, you know what, you know what, Lahoma, I, you know, I just lost my job. I will pay you as soon as I get insurance. What are you going to say? <laughs> no. Girl, it could be six years before I look for a job. Right. If you're going to see me for free, I'm going to sit at home all day and take all of your services. And it's not, you're, you're worth more than that. Mm -hmm. You're just worth more than that. So we don't give our services for free. And that's code of ethics. And I know that many times your agency may have something bit built in, but there's probably some grant money or something behind that that allows you to see the clients for free. We don't do that. Okay. I know, I mean, so I teach you to how to pass the test. And also in real life, I don't think you should ever do that. I think you devalue your education. You devalue what you bring to the table. So you're no more, you're no less important than a doctor, a lawyer, uh, whatever, right? You're an expert of what you bring to the table. Don't, don't give that for free. That's my soapbox. Okay, so <laughs> look at bartering. Uh, we talked about this earlier. This is my last one, guys. I really got to go. My dogs are going to cry. Okay, I'll take it. Go ahead. In most cases, sparring should be aborted as a means of paying for psychotherapy. However, bartering may be permissible in all of the following cases except when. So it should be aborted as a means of paying for psychotherapy. Um, the client requests to barter the bartering would not exploit the therapeutic relationship. Both therapists and clients sign a written contract. The client is facing significant financial hardship, except when the bartering should not exploit the therapeutic relationship. So, I can't, that's, that's a true one. If the client has requested first, it cannot exploit our relationship and we're going to put it in writing. But bartering is not because you don't have any money. Bartering is because you're paying me a different way. Mm. You're giving me eggs, you're giving me fish, you're giving me something else that, that we've agreed to and that's a payment of the community. So, so then I have financial hardship. 
But no, it's not about being po. Remember, that's still pro bono. If you ain't got <laughs> no money, that's still pro bono. Oh. <laughs> that, that's po, not even like poor. You can't even forward all the letters, just, just po. <laughs> I can say that because I know what that means. Okay. So. Okay. P.O. I can't afford the rest of the letters. <laughs> okay. So, so bartering is, and those are the accept questions that are really, really tough, guys. And on the test, they're not written big like that, right? They're, it doesn't say that. So when you're reading those and you're, you're really stuck, that means you miss something in the question. You're missing something. Go back to the question. Why is this so hard for me? Okay. So it's an accept question. So the client remember has to request. I cannot exploit the client. I cannot take, you know, two of his fine thoroughbreds for an hour of therapy. That's not okay. Okay. So, and we're going to put it in writing. So this is what I'm going to do. And this is what we're going to do. But he cannot be uh, financial. I, that's going to hurt him, right? If he's already broke and I take his chickens or his horses or whatever, that's not okay. 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 I got to go because I could do this all night. Uh, questions, guys. Something that you're just been dying to ask. Yeah, you're back with Sierra next week. She, I think she does assessment this week. She researched last week and it's assessment this week. So she'll be here next Saturday. Um, what else? Anything, any theorists that I didn't Theorist cover? That covered. Um, hi, it's Stephanie. I am Hello, Stephanie. How are you? Good, how are you? Good, thank you for asking. Um, have we met before? We have, I believe maybe a few weeks back. I knew that. Yes. We can get much closer <laughs> if you would like. <laughs> I would. I would. I'd like to know the people that, that, that tutor with us. So go ahead. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, I am wondering, what was the order you mentioned as far as studying is concerned? Careers one week, helping relations. So I didn't say, I didn't say one week. You did I not said, say I that. I did not. I did not. I say you until 90 you days. know it. Six Thank day. You. Okay. Yes. Okay. Until, you, so know until you know it, until you can walk into a room and tell someone that super has three theories mm -hmm. and the archway is the, you know, your left is my biological side. And I know the right is the community and at the top is the, our role concept where I define who I am. Sure. So the rainbow is the life space and life roles. Okay. And you've got those um, stages of development as well as the task. G -g Gemmed, right? Those are the stages. And the tasks are then what you should learn in those stages. Okay. So until you can tell somebody that, you don't get to leave super. Okay. Okay. But Dr. Pam, um, like, so I, we have 90 days. How long can we really stay? Because I guess one of my issues is retaining. Um, he told me to start with careers, which I did, and I started with super, but like when I go on to like crumble, and he also has stages, I'm forgetting what the other so stages How many, other how days. many times, how many hours a day are you studying? Three. So you, you spent three hours, six days a week on super three theories? No, sorry. No, you gave me three to study. So you said, don't just do that for that week. Okay, so all three of those, right? So that's three times a day. Three for so one. Rush, so I would just spend like one day on super, one of his theories, right? Mm -hmm. And then that's three hours in the morning. I should be able to really kind of be able to tell somebody about super. If not, I need to listen to that video a couple more times, right? And then if I can't do three, then I need to, I, I'm missing something because we only have 90 days. So we really need to be able to get through careers in about three weeks. And there are 12 career people that we got to know. Okay. So if auditory processing is not working for you, then what you might want to do is, you know, do that, um, put a, a um, like she did the, the flashcards on your refrigerator, um, on your phone. So every time that you have a free second, you're really going over super and his rainbow theory. You know, that crystallization happens between the ages of 14 and 18. That's, he said, people should be able to like, uh, by high school, have an idea of what they're doing. For super said you should be in your career at 24 at 24 i was yeah anyway so that's what you're supposed to know right so that's what it looks like and really just a matter of repetition over and over and over again 
I promise you, you'll get it. It just, it just is about emptying your brain of everything else. Okay, so our plan of study, we, uh, we're going to start with careers first, because career is the one that really you have the, the least amount of things I can, I can reuse in the real world. Then we're going to go to human growth and development. Okay, we're going to pick up counseling and helping professions, take that into a group. Family is in there also. Okay, uh, we're going to do social culture. We're doing code of ethics the entire time. You're going to always read the code of ethics and the code of ethics flows through those questions are so definitely not that clear. And we use research and assessment for last and most often you're going to tutor with our specialists to do those two. And again, we have tons of free videos. Um, we have boot camps, we have wiki groups, we have tons of stuff out there. Okay. It's been a pleasure, guys. Um, stay safe. If you have anybody in the hurricane area, um, be there for them. It's I've, I've lived through a couple of hurricanes. I'm from South Florida, so it's it's scary. Waking up and having nothing is just a really scary place to be. So keep them in your prayers. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Pam.